Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is going to be on protein. Can you consume too much of it where it makes you fat? Uh, we'll dive into the biochemistry, metabolism, we'll break down all the macronutrients and probably what's best for you. And before you do, smash that like button for me. It really helps the YouTube algorithm. Also, give me a share as well. I want to know your comments. Have any of you had experiences where you gain weight by consuming too much protein? Let me know in the comments. All right, let's dive in. So we have this, we have protein, which is a macronutrient. We have three major macronutrients, right? We have protein, okay? We have fats, and we have carbs. These are our three major macronutrients. Just to highlight, um, this is the only macronutrient, carbohydrates, that actually has no, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. We have essential proteins, essential amino acids, we have essential fatty acids, but no essential carbohydrates. It's just important to keep that in the back of, your, back of your mind. Your body can actually make carbohydrate, and it does that through gluconeogenesis. You break the word down, gluco meaning blood sugar or glucose, okay? Neo meaning to make, to make, or new, like new forming, and then Genesis is to create. So new formation of glucose, new formation of glucose, and our body can do that. So gluconeogenesis is something like this. Your body takes in protein, protein gets converted into, well, then essentially you have gluconeogenesis, where our body will take that protein and that will convert it into glucose. And we do this primarily with two major hormones, cortisol and glucagon. Okay? And cortisol is going to affect gluconeogenesis more when you're like starving, when you're like extreme low calorie. Cortisol will be the one that kind of rips it off your actual skeletal muscle. And then Glucagon, you'll, ha you'll have that happen when you actually consume protein. Protein actually stimulates glucagon. The more your insulin levels are low, you actually stimulate more glucagon. So the more your carbohydrates are low, carbohydrates are the major stimulator of insulin, right? The more refined and the higher glycemic, the more insulin you get. So the more you keep insulin in check, you will get this glucagon response, which is on a seesaw, right? So as glucagon goes up, insulin essentially goes down. But glucagon can stimulate uh, blood sugar, right, glucose. And then essentially, there could be then an insulin response to the glucose released by gluconeogenesis from the protein, right? So the protein could increase glucose and thus increase insulin. Now. Is it, if I eat refined carbohydrate versus grass-fed beef protein, which is gonna stimulate more insulin? That's the question. So people in these camps that frame out and try to put out there that protein does and can make you fat, well, relative to what? Right? We have to have a conversation and compare things. So would 100 grams of pure glucose that's in your body that you take in via like a soda drink, would that, caught, would that get converted to fat at the same level of 100 grams of grass-fed beef? Definitely not. Definitely not, not even close. So the more refined and processed that food is, especially processed carbohydrate, you will always make more insulin from that processed carbohydrate, processed sugar, than you will from any whole food source of protein. Especially if whole food sources of protein have fat in there, you're gonna have less of this gluconeogenic response the more the, the protein has good quality fats, right? Grass-fed beef is gonna have gamma linoleic acid, conjugated linoleic acid, omega-3 fatty acids. There's also some saturated fat in there. So in nature, it's very rare to find protein just by itself. So the more we go and we do extra lean sources of protein, uh, boneless, skinless chicken um, breasts, um, deer meat, some, some certain deer cuts can be really lean, rabbit meat, uh, extra whey proteins that aren't timed up post-workout, those things can really increase gluconeogenesis because they're so lean and they don't have any of that extra fat in there. Okay, so this insulin to glucagon ratio 
is real. It's an important thing. People that tend to have lower insulin and less glucagon, it tends to be a good thing. Uh, the EADS talk about this in protein power, right? Glucagon is a, is a good hormone. Dr. Diana Schwarzwein talks about this in the Schwarzwein Principle. And this is how people who eat protein and keep their carbohydrates relatively down, this is how they have regular or maintain their blood sugar. People that tend to have healthy levels of blood sugar, if this is, let's just say, the optimal blood sugar window, right? This is our optimal blood sugar window. The more your carbohydrates go up and down, up and down, you have mood issues, right? So when you're on the high side, what you're doing is you're surging insulin up here, and on the low side, you're surging, let's just say cortisol and adrenaline down here to bring it up. So this isn't good. When you're living on this kind of roller coaster and this is your blood sugar going up and down, you're gonna feel moody, you're gonna be brain fog, you're gonna be anxious, it's gonna be really hard for you to focus. And that's gonna primarily happen with carbohydrate being out of proportion. Now, if here's your optimal blood sugar zone, if we're eating more high quality whole food protein with good healthy fats, you're more than likely gonna have glucose like this. You're gonna be in this optimal zone, so you're not gonna need the high amounts of insulin because you're not peaking up here and you're not gonna need high amounts of cortisol and adrenaline to bring you back up. And glucagon tends to be a little bit more time released, right? And like anything, the more your carbohydrate and glucose is time released, the less other hormones have to come in there and act like the bumper to bring you back into balance. That's important. Like the glycemic index, the glycemic index is all about how fast things get absorbed into your body, right? So the higher something, the faster something gets absorbed in your body, that can essentially cause higher amounts of insulin to be secreted. Now, the exception is fructose is interesting because fructose actually gets metabolized a little bit slower, but what happens is it primarily goes to the liver, and then once that liver gets fully saturated with fructose, it can actually create systemic insulin resistance. That's why fructose and high fructose corn syrup is so bad because you have less of a reservoir for fructose where glucose, you have most of all your skeletal muscle, you got about 80, 88, 80 to 85% more storage room for glucose in your body than you do fructose. That's why fructose is so um, deadly when it's in its refined form because once that liver is like really saturated and pummeled with fructose, you're actually going to have systemic insulin resistance and your insulin levels will have to go up because, um, because your, body's, uh, because your body is, is saturated. There's nowhere else for it to go, so it's gonna start converting it more to fat now. Once that reservoir is saturated, it's gotta go to fat. And it's harder to essentially start burning fat when your fructose levels are high. When fructose and your glucose is level, is, are high, it becomes much, much harder for you to actually burn fat for fuel. Because the more your insulin levels start going up from the fructose, then what happens is high amounts of insulin make it much harder for you to tap in to your fatty acids. It's just how the biochemistry and the endocrinology works. So what's the right amount of protein? I typically tell patients anywhere between a palm to a fist to a full hand. So it can be between 15 to 25% is pretty good. Now again, you're gonna have extremes. You're gonna have people that are doing lots of exercise that may need to go up a little bit higher and their, their overall calories as a whole may be higher. So it just really depends where they're at. So typically a palm to a fist to a full hand. So usually that would be anywhere between, let's just say 0.5 grams of protein per pound. I shouldn't say 0.5, I should say. Yeah, not 0.05, I'm sorry, but 0.5. 0.05 is like nothing. So there we go, 0.5 grams of protein per pound. To one point zero gram of protein. So one to 0.5. So 0.5, that's about 15%-ish up to one gram of protein. Now, if you're guys in the NFL, 
right? People that need to maintain a lot of muscle, they may need, even need to be at like 1.5 to 2 grams of protein, but their, cal their calories are just so high anyway, you only can get that high with ex without, ex you have to expand your calories significantly. You have to be like at a four, five, six, seven thousand calorie range per day. So anywhere between a palm to a fist to a full hand. A full hand is about eight, you know, I'm 6'2", 210 pounds, so a full hand for me, maybe eight to 12 ounces of protein. Um, down to a palm, maybe four, four to five. Someone that's smaller, that could be two to three for a palm, up to six. So the nice thing is bigger people have bigger hands. So I like the hand because when you're kind of serving yourself up food, you're not gonna have time to think about percentages and calories and this. So usually about one gram of protein is about, uh, I should say one ounce of protein is about six to seven grams of protein. So one ounce is about six, seven grams. So then if you're doing a palm, you're at somewhere three to four gram, three to four ounces, which is about 21 to 25 grams of protein. Once you get to a fist, you're maybe at four to six. So for me, that could be, let's say it's five or six ounces. Six times seven is about 42. To a full hand, you may be at 56 to 65 grams of protein. So it kind of gives you a pretty good range. The smaller you are, your hand's gonna be a little bit smaller, so that kind of gauges it up. I typically recommend go more to a palm the less active you are, and then replace the calories you're not getting with extra fat sources, whether it's an extra spoonful of butter, some coconut oil, uh, maybe a handful of nuts. Just try to replace that with good fat sources. Fat tends to be very neutral when it comes to stimulating insulin. Protein can be a little bit more in the middle. And then carbohydrate, and the more refined the carbohydrate, that's gonna be the highest sources. And of course, your vegetable non-starchy carbohydrate are very negligible in general. All right, hope this video was helpful for you and kind of helping to dial in your macronutrients. If you have metabolic issues, adrenal issues, hormone issues, thyroid issues, of course, thyroid plays onto this whole entire biochemistry as well. Feel free, click below, schedule a consult with myself or my colleagues. I look forward to helping you out. Let me know your experiences below and hit that thumbs up button and give me a share too. Appreciate it, y'all. You guys have a phenomenal night. Take care. Bye.